Welcome everybody. This is Andrew Jones here at Climate Interactive. I'm here with Bindu Bandari, Climate Interactive as well, who's coming in from uh, Kathmandu, Nepal. And we're thrilled that you're here for the En-ROADS Climate Workshop. We're in the middle of UN Climate Week here in New York City, which has often been a big gathering of people thinking together about how to address climate change. And we're excited to welcome people who came in because of that spark, UN Climate Week, but also just the people who are hearing about the role of the simulator En-ROADS in working with us to address our shared mission. Of course, our shared mission is to address climate change, to avoid all the possible warming in the future and all of the disruption to our ecosystems and our economies, et cetera and in parallel address justice and equity such that when we implement policies, we actually help and not hurt the marginalized communities we're trying to, uh, we're trying to protect by helping the climate. Justice and equity is one of our big goals. And so you'll see as we use the simulator, we will be asking these questions at the same time. What really helps? How do we make sure that we do this in a just way, just transition and addressing equity? The core of this, of course, of what we're doing, is going to be easy using this simulator, En-ROADS. En-ROADS is freely available. You can go right now and uh, Google En-ROADS, or actually, Bindu, would you just drop into chat, send the link to the model, let people play with it right away, and it is going to let you test really quickly any policies around energy efficiency and electrification and more renewables, et cetera. You can see me setting a carbon price and then running it over and over again. Um, it's allowing you, with a model that's grounded in the best available literature, to test the kinds of strategies you think are interesting and important and um, engage other people with this freely available tool. That's what we're going to be up to today. Um, and overall, though, as you engage with uh, the workshop and you have any questions, please do use the question box. I'm showing you right now where you can write questions. Bindu Bandari is available right now to answer many of them, direct you to places on the website. A little more, more background though. We're Climate Interactive, a US-based not-for-profit think tank. We work closely with MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative to develop En-ROADS and the workshop around it. We built the model using the best available science. We've calibrated it to the available literature. Actually, I want to show you uh, let me just go there and show a little bit of how we did some of the testing of the model. Um, here you can see a, a graph which shows from 2000 to 2100 scenarios from the integrated, excuse me, integrated assessment models for a scenario they call SSP2, which is the middle of the road shared socioeconomic pathway. And over on the right, you see the list of all the different integrated assessment models that are being shown here. So this red line shows all those lines are six different integrated assessment models version of a baseline future where greenhouse gas net emissions goes up and up and up, temperature goes above four degrees, a world we don't want to see. The orange area are slightly less warming, yellow is less and less and less. These are the published scenarios. And one of the ways that we build confidence in En-ROADS is by comparing against this to say when we put in the carbon price that they put in to their model and other changes, do we get the same results? So now I'll show you um, the thick line is En-ROADS comparing. You can see that we're in the envelope for the same reaction of greenhouse gas net emissions to the inputs that they input. So um, we did the same for 29 other variables to test those and also for the other SSP scenarios. So this is one of the ways that we do our testing to help build our confidence. But, so that's a little bit of the background. What we wanna to do today, we thought, was to explore a little bit about this exciting news. I mean, anybody in the climate world uh, certainly has heard, if you follow the headlines, that China, a country, top global emitter, aims to go carbon neutral by 2060. This is huge news in the world of global actions to address climate change. Of course, in the Paris Agreement, they had pledged to have their peak emissions in 2030, now to go carbon neutral by 2060. 
And we were happy that the Associated Press reached out to us and asked, um, well, how much would that affect global temperature in the long term? And our partner, John Sturman, who is the lead scientist in our work, uh, said that that would actually reduce temperature 0.2 to 0.4 degrees Celsius out in the future. And that's a calculation being done with our models. Similarly, our colleagues at Climate Action Tracker talked about what that would do to long-term temperature, saying that that would get us down to 2.4 or 2.5 degrees C, as opposed to 2.7, which is what implementation of all global policies and actions that were stated would get us. So why not spend some time together to explore how China could do that? <laughs> you know, so imagine you're Xi Jinping, just as an exercise to think, here you are, um, how would one do that? What are the policies and actions that are necessary to get to net zero by 2060? What does it take? And of course, we have a global model. Um, so we can't just, we haven't modeled China. Uh, so this is an exercise that's more about the world. What if the world adopted that same pledge? So. If you would, go in the questions box, think for a few minutes, go in the questions box and then write, uh, what are the most powerful ways that China could meet this goal? And therefore, if the world followed, what should the world do to try to get to carbon neutral by 2060? Write it in there and we're gonna look at this in two ways. One of them is the effectiveness of it to achieve the goal using En-ROADS. But secondly, we want to use this as a, a time to think about how to implement those policies in ways that build equity and justice in the world at the same time. So I'm starting to look and see what people are reading. Um, Bindu, do you, would you read out some of the, um, yeah. what you're seeing as answers? Do you, we're starting to get some answers. What are the ways that we can do it? What are people saying? And we, yeah, I can see a lot of responses coming in, and most of the responses uh, actually direct towards a carbon price, putting a carbon price. But uh, there are also other responses like change in agricultural practices, reduce the use of coal, eliminate coal power plants, and replace that energy with renewables. Energy efficiency, again, carbon tax, carbon tax, a lot of people wow. pushing for carbon tax, a low <laughs> carbon diet. So agriculture and carbon tax uh, come yeah. to the main response. People are talking a lot about carbon price, carbon price, carbon price, energy efficiency. Some just address coal directly, stop coal. I'm seeing a, like carbon price, stop coal directly, renewables, um, electric vehicles. So I'm gonna, um, let's just start playing with some of these. So, um, and, So what we're going to do is we're going to test some of these, but along the way, let's add in a second consideration. So what I'm really hearing, just to be clear, let's start, everyone, so many people said carbon price. So let's talk about it first in this context of equity and justice. Uh, we don't want to just implement any policy just to help the climate. We really want to make sure that we are addressing the whole suite of issues that are under consideration right now. So one question that needs to get asked, what way could implementation of a carbon price, if it's not done really well, actually hurt historically marginalized communities? What should we be looking at? And then secondly, what might it, how might it help? What are the things that should be done to make sure that this implementation addresses equity? So either answer, either Please write in, watch out for these ways that it could actually hurt. We have to think about this, but also please include how it could actually help. So we're interested in reading some of those. Anyone answering those questions yet? Yes. So the responses are like refund tax revenues to households. Economically marginalized communities would be more vulnerable uh, to the advice adverse impacts so think of them great so let me just take those two uh those adverse impacts about the cost of energy and then the idea of refund tax revenues to households is what dorothy jones wrote let's just 
and and I'll ask you, Bindu, if you can capture or remember some of them, because we're going to have to come back here in a second and look at them. But let's just play with that. Okay. So the main thing we've heard is let's look at carbon price. And let's look at these two considerations about what happens to the revenue and also to energy prices to people. Because poor, uh, lower income communities, people in those households pay a larger fraction of their energy, of their overall income for their energy. So what I'm going to do is in this world, we're going to implement a carbon price. In the world that we're implementing it, you can see over on the left, we have the global sources of primary energy from 2000 to 2100. The brown area is coal increasing. Here's oil in red. It's growing, but then shrinking a little bit as we have peak coal out in the latter half of the century. On top in blue is natural gas. The green is renewables, bioenergy in pink, nuclear in light blue. If this is the source of our energy and we have methane, nitrous oxide, and F gases, add it all up, and this is greenhouse gas net emissions total. This is the pollutant that is leading to climate change. The total adding up of all those gases. That amount of emissions leads to this amount of warming, 4.1 degrees, which is a baseline future, not our forecast of where we're headed. It is a reasonable future against which to compare. Um, so in that world, we're going to set a carbon price and we're going to start by, um, I think we'll choose $100 a ton. By the way, you can go under here and set many other, and we can try what we like. So we're ready for $100 a ton. I'd like you to think first, though. What's going to change the most? Which of these areas is going to change the most in the top left? What's it going to affect? Coal, oil, gas, renewables? How much? What's going to get bigger? What's going to get smaller? So think in your head. Use this not as just an answer tool, but as a prompt for you to think. All right, here it goes. I'm gonna hit it, and we'll hit it and repeat it, repeat it several times. I'm gonna hit this repeat button, replay. What changes the most? Coal. Look at that brown area of coal shrinking. Coal is the most sensitive to a carbon price. So we have a good bit less coal. And we, you notice the red area of oil doesn't change quite as much. Uh, here in the United States, $100 a ton only increases the price of gas 90 cents a gallon, which is not enough to have people radically change uh, the vehicles that they purchase, et cetera. Um, gas changes somewhat. What does the green area of wind and solar do? You can see it is expanding. And you notice that the, the, the total area, that is, look at the whole, the top line here shrinks. That means total energy demand is shrinking at the same time. Because of those impacts, greenhouse gas net emissions, instead of rising with the black line, flattens around the blue line, and we get a good bit less greenhouse gas net emissions. Temperature goes from 4.1 down to 3.3, a huge reduction of 0.8 degrees. Now, of course, our exercise we just said is China said net zero, carbon neutral by 2060. What that would look like is this blue line going down, down, down to here to be zero in 2060. So you can see it's not a silver bullet. It's not a silver bullet. It won't get us all the way there to have this carbon price. Now, we could imagine higher carbon prices, and here you could test $179 a ton, $234 a ton, much higher. Um, we could also imagine a carbon price that increases after 2030. So it might be appropriate to imagine a longer term growth plan for carbon price. So imagine what if the carbon price really went up to say, I don't know, $300 a ton um, starting in say 2030 after we achieve that first carbon price and do that over the next, say, 50 years or so. So here we are over 50 years, you can see it's rising and rising. So a high and rising carbon price, the Citizen Climate Lobby wants an even higher one, but it looks like this is able to increase. If it increased over time, you can see the huge reduction in global sources of primary energy, greenhouse gas emissions peaks in the 2020s and then falls slowly and we get to three degrees. 
a huge contribution, not a silver bullet, but boy, does it help. Okay, so I told you we would ask two questions within ROADS. How much do, do actions help? Secondly, what are the equity implications? And I asked you, how do we implement this in a way that doesn't hurt the marginalized communities that we're trying to help with these policies? So when we think of that, um, look over here to some other graphs that we can look at. I'll ask you to think, what would happen to energy costs if we have a high carbon price? So this graph shows the challenge of a high carbon price. Cost of energy, now this is global, this isn't just showing electricity for a home or gas for a car, uh, petrol. Um, overall, on average, energy gets much more expensive. This is the challenge that we face, one of them with equity. How do we make sure that we don't disproportionately affect marginalized communities, or just people in general. Well, uh, the second suggestion that you gave in your question box is really relevant, and that was to say, what happens to all the revenue? And if you go down here, and you'll notice when you play with En-ROADS, there are many graphs that are not shown. You know, this is the, the easiest way to find graphs is to go right here to this. You can see uh, our favorite 12 graphs, but over here, um, you can see many of the specific graphs and one of them is in the financial area and it has to do with the revenue from tax and subsidies this is the government revenue from the carbon price which by 2040 is 5.4 trillion dollars a year what someone wrote in their question box was to dividend this back give this back to citizens give it back particularly to the people whose energy prices are being affected by this carbon price. So that's one way that we could address equity and make sure that this doesn't hurt people. But other people wrote when we asked, how could this help those communities? Well, we're excited that we can also now have a new factor in here, which is about air quality. So I'd like you to think, actually we'll look over here, and let's just think about what would happen to emissions of energy-related uh, air pollution? in this future and uh, before i show you think about it for a second where are we getting our energy now look at the green area much more renewables and i'll show you if you click on the three dots you can see the blue line for renewables is going up a lot more renewables um, what's happening with coal a lot less coal so think pm 2.5 is one of the main pollutants that causes heart disease respiratory problem lung cancer Air pollution kills, of all the global deaths every year, one out of seven is connected to air pollution, says the World Health Organization. So think about what would happen to air pollution in the future. Go under impacts, scroll down here, air pollution by source. The, the black line is the business as usual. The top area, I'll show it more simply, air pollution from energy, the blue line, how much better air pollution gets, look and see. And not just how much better it gets as a total improvement, look how soon it gets better in the 2020s. One challenge we have with climate change is when we see the benefits. You think about a carbon price like that, when do we see the temperature getting better? Click over here to temperature, it's not until 2030 or so, or 2035 that we see the temperature implications. It's not until later than that that we see sea level rise implications however air pollution changes now we burn less coal less emissions health improves immediately and therefore huge financial gains to, from red dot reduced health costs okay so we've tried one thing and i'm going to go back bring us back to the what we were looking at before um, here we were we've tried one action carbon price it's not a silver bullet we have to watch out for what it does to household energy prices, but we also can take the revenue and give it back to people, and it really helps air quality. It helps the climate so much for two ways. It changes the energy mix. It also leads to less energy demand. Look at the blue line. We would use a lot less energy. There would be more motivation for energy efficiency if we had such a carbon price. So I asked you, what could China do? A carbon price gets you a good bit of the way there. There were other ideas of ways to do it that could be different. And just to know, let's try one of those other paths now. 
So I said carbon price, we tried that. And so here we are with carbon price. Um, I'm gonna switch back over. Now we're gonna look at another, here's En-ROADS again, same model without the carbon price and try it differently. Many people talked about coal and they said, and of course China, because of those air pollution concerns and other things, is really trying to get rid of coal. Other ways to get there, what if you just went after coal as a strategy? Scroll down here under coal, and what you can do is you can say, stop building new coal infrastructure. So what if we just stopped building new coal infrastructure? Think, what's gonna happen? The brown line, obviously it's gonna, the brown area is gonna shrink. What else is going to change there? Ready? All right, think about what it's gonna do. Think about what you think it's gonna do to temperature less coal. This is more of a regulatory approach, just ban coal infrastructure into the future. I'll hit the replay button, 4.1, 3.6. So it shaves off a huge half a degree, but there's some other changes that also happen. There's a large amount of demand. There's no carbon price in this scenario. What happens to say natural gas? Watch over on the right, with this policy, we have more natural gas, not less. So a carbon price brings down coal, oil, and gas. Just going after coal, there's what we call the squeeze the balloon problem. Have you ever had an old balloon and squeezed it? You try to close it in one area and then boop, it pops up in another area. So what's happening? Less coal, there's still that energy demand. Where does it go? More natural gas. So you can see how this could really help. However, what would be need to be done regula in a regulatory sense would be, well, probably ban natural gas as well, or something like it. So you can imagine if we were able to stop building new gas infrastructure as well, then you get even more of an impact. Now, what that's doing is leading to um, other changes in the system, a good bit more wind and solar, renewables energy grows, a lot, nuclear grows a little bit more, but we get to 3.3 degrees. Um, of course, you could imagine other scenarios like this and what people suggested in the question box was, uh, this is the keep it in the ground strategy. It would be just decide that we're not gonna have oil, um, fossil fuel infrastructure, so we're gonna ban that as well. 2.8 degrees if we bring all coal, oil, and gas down to zero. A huge amount of wind and solar. It gets a lot easier, of course, if we electrify as well. Uh, it gets a lot easier for the economy to handle this. So two different paths, one of them more carbon price, one of them just, just ban uh, these things, and two paths to get there. Of course, what is likely to happen around the world is a mix as different countries take different approaches. So I hope though what I'm offering you in the world is for your students, for your business leaders, for your government leaders, for your community groups, is a platform of this free simulation that allows you to ask what if questions. What if we did this? What if we did that? To test your own thinking using a grounded simulator and then to engage other people in thinking about what's gonna be effective in addressing climate change and also to prompt some of these important questions about equity so that along the way, we're helping people in the near term, particularly with the other factors that we might care about, such as health, such as water, such as just fairness out in the world, uh, such as energy access, such as community strength and resilience. So that's the offer to you. Now, some of the resources that are behind it as you think about these futures is of course, you know, when you implement any policy, click under here and you'll hit the I button. And there are many examples, some of the prompts about equity and justice, key dynamics, what the slider settings are, everything is documented here. Secondly, you have a chance to share your vision with the world. If you like this, keep it in the ground plan, you click on share your scenario here. You can say, I'm gonna share it on Twitter. Then you go to Twitter, and you can literally see this. You see it says, here's a climate scenario built with En-ROADS. So if I click this and I tweet it out, boom, there it goes. So on Twitter right now, see that? Here's a climate scenario. So that in the world, people can go read your scenario, see what is your vision for addressing climate change. 
Um, in fact, I'll grab this one, copy the scenario link. You know, it also makes sense to put it into chat. So I'm going to send you right now uh, in chat. Open up in chat, click on it, and here comes the scenario that you can share it with other people. Um, in fact, I'm glad I just shared this with you because we have a challenge ahead of us. We're at three degrees, and our challenge was can we replicate what China is trying to do around the world, carbon neutral by 2060? We're not, by 2060, we still have 54 gigaton CO2 under this scenario. What else would need to be done? So I just sent you this scenario, go try it yourself. But I'm gonna give you some hints. Here's some hints. Your hints are where are the gases coming from? This is a graph that shows in green land use CO2, mostly from deforestation. Black is energy CO2. That is from burning coal, oil, and gas. F gases are in brown. Methane is there in blue on top of it, nitrous oxide. Those are the gases we will need to get rid of to get to be carbon neutral. And then of course we have the potential for negative emissions. So I'll pause for a second. This is the scenario with the carbon price. Bindu, what are the actions other than the carbon price that have been suggested that we haven't tried yet? What else can we do to get well below two degrees? Electrification in transport sector. Great, electrification in the transport sector. Okay, so here we are. Why would we do that? Well, look at all that oil that we're burning. What if we electrify more? We've decarbonized the grid a good bit. Let's crank up electrification. That is another 0.2 degrees. That would be a big help, another 0.2 degrees. And what it's doing is notice how it is increasing the green area of renewables and shrinking gas and shrinking oil. No, shrinking oil primarily. That gets us down to 2.8. Where does electrification go? All the way up here to about 70% electric share of final energy and transport is electric in that scenario. Thank you. What else, Bindu? What are some others that you're seeing that people are suggesting there in the questions box? And if you have other suggestions, write it in the questions box. Yeah, I can see people also saying for going with vegetarian diets, more plant-based diets. And the next was uh, also about energy efficiency in buildings and industry. Great. Okay. Two of them. One of them, vegetarian diets, plant-based diets. Now, that's pointing us at agriculture and forestry. Um, two effects from plant-based diets, less consumption, particularly for cattle, that is a big source of methane. One of them is that if we needed less agricultural land to feed cattle, we would have less deforestation emissions. Watch over here as deforestation emissions goes down, it'll be the green area of land use CO2. So watch that as that green area shrinks. Can you see that? You see it shrink? 2.8 goes to 2.7. Not another silver bullet, but it is another help. The other, of course, is reduction of methane. Look at that big blue area. See the blue area? That is emissions of methane. Now I'm gonna change it. This is beyond cattle and in agriculture, but going into other areas of reducing methane. Ready? How much do you think it's gonna change the temperature? Think, 2.7 goes where? Do it in your head, 2.6, 2.5, 1.5, 1.6. It shaves off a full 0.4 degrees. We're at 2.3. Actin in methane, nitrous oxide in F gases matters a lot. Uh, it's not affecting energy directly, Instead, see how it's shaving off a lot of those emissions in the latter half of the century of methane, nitrous oxide, F gases, 2.3. Someone mentioned, or Bindu, you said energy efficiency. Now, the way that energy efficiency helps is it keeps, particularly in buildings, gas and coal in the ground. And look, gas in blue, coal has been reduced a lot, but perhaps will have more effect on go on um, gas in the long term. And I wanna note, you're not gonna see as much effect here with energy efficiency as if we didn't have a carbon price. If we didn't have a carbon price, energy efficiency on its own is much bigger, but because you already have input a policy that has reduced coal, its marginal contribution is somewhat less, but that's okay. Here we are, we're going to improve, increase the improvement rate 
of energy intensity of new capital from 1.2 up here to about 3%. And I'm going to run that again. Let's see, that gets us from another 0.1 degree. What are you seeing? There's no silver bullet. It's taking many seeds to plant this garden. It's taking actions in many different sectors. We've got a carbon price. We've got energy efficiency in buildings and industry, electrification and transport, less deforestation, cutting methane and other in agriculture and in industry and other areas, 2.2 degrees, putting all those together. What else, Bindu? We want to get below two if we can. How are we doing? What else can we do? Yeah, afforestation, growing more trees. Uh, people are writing about that. And the next is uh, new technology. Someone is curious to know what this new technology yeah. does. Thank you. Okay. So afforestation, growing more trees. There's been a lot of talk about the huge impact. Uh, when we run the numbers, there is an impact and it could be an important solution. However, we're finding that a lot of the media's characterization of the overall impact on temperature is exaggerated. We had to write a blog post. Bindu, can you find that blog post that uh, Florian and John Sturman just wrote with our analysis um, and just put it into chat? I'll bet Florian will send it in with a question box because he just finished it. Um, an excellent analysis of afforestation and its potential contribution. So here we are at 2.2 degrees. I'm pulling up sources of removal the beauty of afforestation is that it pulls carbon out of the atmosphere. Everything you see over on the right is what's going into it. How about removals? What if we grow a large amount of trees? I'm going to do 100% of what the Royal Society thinks is the middle estimate of what's potential. And there we go. Click. I'm going to try it again. 2.2 goes to 2.1. We think it would help about 0.1 degree. Would that help? Temperature in the future? Yes. Is it as large as being talked about? No. Why? Largely, it takes a long time to get those emissions out of the atmosphere. Even when we make changes in here and assume that it's not going to take 10 years to find the land all around the world. You'll notice I'll make a change and make it five. You notice, watch this green area of removals moves earlier even if the planning time isn't 30 years, but it's 16 years. It takes a long time. It's not the 2050s and 2060s until we're able to plant all those trees and then slowly photosynthesis pulls carbon out of the atmosphere, puts it into biomass and soils, and it pulls it out. We also have, of course, returns because trees die and then re-emit the emissions back to the atmosphere. It's about, what is that? A maximum of eight gigatons a year. It shows up here in the green area as negative emissions, pulling it out of the atmosphere. One note along the way, if you hear those assumptions and you think, well, I don't like those assumptions, I think we can do better, please go under simulation and assumptions and look under afforestation settings. And you can say, well, I think you've chosen an afforestation growth time that's too long, it's 70 years. I think we could find more land, the uh, Crowther's, like the Baston et al. paper, is more like 900 million hectares. So it could be more possibly. If it was, of course, you'd want to calculate, well, how much land would that require? This is the amount of land. Talk about that question of equity. How, what is the impact of implementation on the marginalized communities that we're trying to help in the world today and in this world? Who lives on this 900 million hectares? Currently, who would have to move to make this uh, plantations or uh, other kinds of trees being grown in order to remove carbon. This is the area of over two Indias of area. The dotted line is India. This is going up to 900 million hectares, over two total areas of India of new forests. So these are some of the equity considerations that ought to be looked at. But the good news is that we are now here at two degrees. I'm actually gonna just, I was just testing those things. I don't really wanna put in 900 million hectares. I'm gonna reduce this back down to 700, but we're still at two degrees, which is good news. Uh, let's get below. What's the last thing you're probably look, looking at this video and saying that we could get below two degrees. What is another action that could get us there? I see someone was suggesting degrowth mindset. Interesting. So right now our, Economic growth is 
2.5% per year. There are a lot of people talking about a simplicity movement. Are there ways that we can meet our needs without continually growing the material consumption of our economy? Many people are thinking about that. What if we could meet global needs and address equity, but not grow 2.5% a year, but instead 2.2 or 2.1? And you'll see that's not a silver bullet, but it did, with this rate of gross of gross world product, get us below two degrees. Okay, now I'm not saying this is the best scenario. This is a scenario that we constructed. It's an example, and I want us to, well, first of all, I wanna share it with you. Actually, I'm gonna go back over here to what we, where we started, and greenhouse net emissions are almost net zero at 2060. We're not quite there, but that's where we've landed. I'm going to copy scenario link, and let's just, I'm gonna share it with everybody. And here we go, I'm gonna post it. You can go look at this scenario and try it yourself. So what I'd like you to do, actually, I'm kind of dying to get down to that, to that net zero 2060, right? China said they would do it. What if the whole world do it? did it? What else would be necessary? Um, and I'm just gonna add in here some of the other things I saw suggested. Some people talked about renewables, which could squeeze down on, oh, uh, gas some more. Also, someone said a new technology. Uh, there's a whole nother story, and I encourage you to go. We have some videos about it. At this point, there's a challenge with a new technology. This would be like thorium fission or nuclear fusion. What's that gonna do to wind and solar? Watch if here. Largely at this point with all of these policies, if we add a new technology, what it's mostly doing is eating to the market share of wind and solar. In this future, we just have a different zero carbon long-term energy, which is nuclear-based as opposed to wind and solar-based. What's needed if we wanna get down to 1.5 or get to net zero by 2060, what would be needed really would be this point, you've heard so much discussion, of what could be done with carbon removal. So here we are, net zero by around 2060, 1.5 degrees. If the whole world adopted China's pledge, 1.5, here we are putting it all together. Okay, this has been really intense, everybody. I've been going through and changing graphs, changing things really quickly. I wanna just slow down for a second, and I want us to just look at what's happened. We have imagined the future, We've simulated it here in En-ROADS with a high and rising carbon price, incentives for more, re more renewables, energy efficiency in buildings and industry, radical electrification of the transportation sector, a degrowth mindset, less deforestation, growing more trees, a significant amount of carbon removal, and reduction of methane and others in industry, wastewater, landfills, agriculture, cattle. Putting it all together, emissions peak around 2025 and they fall steadily to around net zero in the 2060s to deliver a temperature around 1.5. There's a lot of uncertainty. It could be a little higher, a little lower. We could test those scenarios. But what I'd like you to do is just for a moment, consider what we've learned. There's no silver bullet. It takes many seeds to plant this garden. You see, it's possible. Still, we could bend the climate system and the infrastructure of energy and agriculture and the economies on earth to get towards this kind of future. Many futures are likely possible. Let's consider this one more deeply for a second. Consider this possibility. And I'd like to ask you, um, I'd like you to think, and I'm gonna be silent for 60 seconds. I'd like you to think, join me in silence not a thing you usually do in a webinar. Join me in silence and answer this question silently in your own head. What would you love about being part of a world that was making this scenario happen? What would you love about being part of a world that was making a scenario something like this or what you have in mind happen? And I really am gonna do my stopwatch. and It's gonna be silent for 60 seconds. Think, what would you love what would you love? We're going to have 60 seconds of silence.
All right, that's been a minute. Please, 10 words or less, write it in your question box. Ideally, five words. Write in the question box. We're really curious what in these difficult times, both on equity and on climate, what's getting you to work as hard as you do to take the time to come to a webinar like this? What would you love about being part of a world on track to make this happen? Bindu, are anyone answering yet? Can yeah, a lot of responses. Go so ahead. to be to be an ambassador and do my best to reduce my own impacts, the calming sense that I am contributing to preserving all that I love about our natural world for my uh, seven grandchildren and a chance to regain some hope. We could trust each other that we are all looking after the future for our children and their children too. Knowing I'm contributing to the solution, proud that we pulled together globally for common good, just to feel that I am contributing to make the world a better place to live. Fantastic. Renewing the soul of the world, peace on earth, creating a sustainable future, reduce Fantastic. my climate grief, involve the politicians I know. It would be easier everyone who wins, low cost, low carbon energy, develop blue carbon and conservation projects, enjoy clean air, Fantastic. Sustainable ecosystem for all generations. This is so great. Thank you for all of your, your answers. And sorry we can't read all of them, but um, it's just beautiful to see what, what you're thinking about and what this means to you. And really, of course, the next question is, is obvious. What's the next right thing for you to do? Our main direction is what in the world, where is the place where you can lead and make a difference? I do. As you think about that, I do want to direct you to toward the possibility of one of the things that's possible, and that is to be part of the En-ROADS Climate Ambassador Program. This workshop that Bindu and I are leading right now is being led right now by 216 climate ambassadors in 40 countries and 24 languages. Many of those people are here on the call right now. Welcome, you folks. So happy you're back. Uh, but we invite you to be part of that group. And really to do it, you would just go to our website, uh, which is here. And there's a great picture of Bindu. There's Bindu on the, on the front. And you, what you would do is go here to Climate Workshop and En-ROADS Climate Workshop. And then there's the En-ROADS Training Program. Engage in the training program. There are these uh, ten, eight webinars, um, which teach you how to run this workshop. And then if you run all the workshops, you become an ambassador. And if you like, you could join our ambassadors. Here you are. Many of you, I just saw Laurent Richard, and uh, there's Laurent, and there's Florian right next to him. Uh, so join this group of people who are engaging others in the world. That is one possible action, is to join this community of people around the world. And oh, we mentioned 24 languages, of course, uh, folks in who are leading the Spanish, I hope you know that here we can imagine this whole scenario in Spanish. We're putting this into other languages as well. Florian's working on German, uh, Laurent on French. So take the training series. You can learn about the simulator. You can facilitate sessions, gain insights, begin your journey. Here's where all of the materials are. But my main question to you, of course, what is the next right thing to do? Answer the question box. Maybe it's around En-ROADS. I'd much rather hear you're not using En-ROADS. I'd much rather hear that you are uh, implementing a huge policy to go carbon neutral as soon as possible in your neighborhood, in your business, in your country, in your state, in your province. Uh, write in your question box, what are you gonna do? What's the next right thing for you to do? We wanna know what's coming out of this. Work as a team in each country, educationally. Start a carbon capture technology company, says James. What are others that you see, Bindu? I see someone said that uh, I'm a professor and I will educate my children using En-ROADS. Uh, planning carbon neutrality for my business. Foster innovation spread out the world. Shareholder advocacy. 
build a radical climate focused and equity focused political organization i'm going to take the works up to more young people through the e european youth parliament motivate my sunrise sunrise movement students translate the game into russian ah oh pause on one second translate the game <laughs> into russian i don't think we mentioned that one of the forms that this takes uh you you're experiencing right now the workshop and the workshop is engaging somebody it could be just one person it could be a thousand people in answering these questions what shall we do how do we make sure it addresses equity what do you love about this future what are you going to do about it using the simulator that's the workshop we talked about the game and the game is another version of it and in the game you engage people to play roles. So pictures down here at the bottom are so wonderful. Here are people playing the roles of fossil fuel companies, of businesses around the world, of land, forest, and ag, climate justice hawks. Um, here they are, pictures of people playing the game. Someone just said they're going to translate into Russian. We have a facilitator guide. We have all the materials. They get these sheets of paper that say what their role is. A very engaging way to play it. Here are the events that have been played around around the world with the game so that's another way to do it please keep going what are some other actions sure you with my NGO we are offering this workshop to young politicians and uh, tell people about hopeful ways to solve climate change intensify education on climate change translate in Greek uh, our company has committed to decarbonize and to bring our stakeholders in our journey Great. Hoping to present a small fusion project to several billionaires next year. Fantastic. Looking forward to experiencing the game at uh, Nasaga in Montreal next month. One consideration along the way are other resources. I've talked along the way about equity and uh, really emphasizing how we want to use this model to make sure that what we do really helps it's high leverage it gets us where we want to go but we also want to make sure that we build equity along the way we call that effort multi-solving protecting the climate while improving health equity and well-being and we have resources online particularly uh recently case studies of examples of actions by countries by cities and states that achieve that so it, we call it great, green, resilient, and equitable actions for transformation. And what I'm gonna do is pull up the great page and you'll see here, um, tools here. These are examples of policies that multi-solve for economic recovery, equity, and the climate. So, here are policies and actions say the national level in canada they have an economic recovery plan that addresses some of these issues here in nigeria in germany florian a stimulus package that addresses equity at the same time as climate and economic recovery so there are abundant resources that are out there um, for how countries and regions are implementing these various policies together Okay, I'm gonna pause now and go, I think we'll stick around after the top of the hour, but I wanna ask Bindu, what are questions, were there any questions that didn't get answered that you think are universally interesting that ought to be considered? Yeah, I see an interesting question coming from Hita. So can this tool be used to explain climate change to kids to get them to start thinking from a young age or do you think it's a little complex for them? Great question. Can this be used with kids? So the short answer is yes. What I just took you through is seriously appropriate to take to kids. I've done a sessions with really young children as young as 10 or 11 with this simulator. There's one tool that's kind of helpful here, um, which is uh, the we have the related examples. One thing as a prompt that can be done is to pull up this related examples view. I'm gonna pull up the graphs that I like before. Um, 
here are the two ways to look at it. Um, the related examples view, let's get it back up. And these show icons and pictures of the 16 different areas. So what you can do with a 10 year old kid is just to say, okay, see that number? It's four. What number is below four? They'll say three. What below that? Two. Your goal in this game is to get that temperature of four down to three and then down to two and figure out what it takes in the world. You don't need to make a big scary lecture about climate change and about all the impacts of it. Just to introduce this, make it a game. How do we get that down? And here are your 16 areas. You can do things about buses and transportation, about cars and electrification. You can do it about energy efficiency and buildings and of course translate that into you know what happens in a house, turning off the lights in energy efficiency. Wind and solar, they know what windmills look like. Coal, oil, gas, you can see all the different growing trees, cows. So just talk about these 16 areas and then make the changes. You'll notice these inputs, the sliders don't have numbers here. The old version said 1.5 or 3.3. You don't need to teach an 11 year old the improvement rates of percent per year. You're just saying with energy efficiency, is it increased? Is it increased highly or just increased? Those are the changes that you're making. Relatively simple. So talk to a kid, ask them what they want to try. They will do things and click around. Of course, you want to slow it down they, so that you don't just click like this. You don't want them just randomly clicking around and seeing what does it take to get to two degrees. Instead, slow the conversation down. But yes, it can work really well. Other questions that you see? Yeah, a, co a couple of folks were asking about if the model can uh, actually deal with country-specific reductions or region-specific? Regional-specific reductions. Um, great question. The short answer is no. Uh, this is a global model, but two places to go. If you want to uh, find regional specific reductions or country specific, I encourage you to go to uh, Energy Innovations model. Energy Innovation. Uh, Bindu, can you send everybody the link to Energy Innovation? Actually, you know, I'm right here right now. I don't want to make you look around. Um, so here's that model, which has uh, models you say for select a region and for example, China, <laughs> what does it actually take to get to be net zero by 2060? Here it is. That said, another way to look at this issue um, is via our other model. And you can go and Bindu, would you send the link to C roads? So we've been talking about N roads, but our other publicly available model is about regions and about countries. And it is about how various regional emissions come together to achieve temperature goals. In fact, uh, you saw that calculation that I showed you earlier. At the very start, I showed you this. I'm going to go back over to um, the very start of my presentation. And I showed you that John Sturman said that if China fulfills the goal, According to a very rough estimate by John Sturman, who does these, who tracks models and tracks emissions reductions and pledges with Climate Interactive, this was in the Associated Press and actually in hundreds of newspapers, where did that number 0.2 to 0.4 degrees Celsius come from? Well, it came from our simulator, and you could go right now and recreate the analysis. So here's the simulator, C Rhodes. Bindu is sending you the link right now. Here's a possible future. And you'd say, well, what is the effect of the China pledge? Well, one way to do it would be to start with the pledge. Now, mind you, this is in rough form. We have a much more detailed model if you want to do exactly this calculation uh, with more precision. But if you want to engage others in a way of thinking together, show them what's happening by using C roads. Here's, uh, see that light blue line? That's China's emissions. It was expected to grow and flatten the future. Other developing countries, here's the US in red, EU in green, other developed in Russia and others in gold. 
Well, if China followed its pledge to the Paris Agreement, they said, we will flatten our emissions, peak emissions by 2030. So 2030, ready? Here comes 2030. Notice that. So the blue line went down, it was 2100. Before, if it was changed to 2030, 2030, here we go. Watch the temperature, it goes down from 4.1 to 3.8. So just peaking emissions by 2030, and you can imagine it could be smoother, but just as a rough back of the envelope, 4.1 goes to 3.8. But what they said was 2060 carbon neutral. How would you test that? Well, what if in 2030, and this is gonna be an odd shape, but that's okay for a back of the envelope calculation. That 3.8, what does it take to get to be carbon neutral? Now I played with it early this morning. So I know that roughly 8% a year reduction. Now, in this model, and I'll watch what happens, those emissions get to be just about carbon neutral by 2060. It's not quite there, but pretty darn close by 2060. And that took, what was that before? 3.8 down to 3.5. So here, zero, 3.8, and then you change it to 8%, back of the envelope, 0.3 degrees, 0.3 degrees would be the effect. Uh, John Sturman said 0.2 to 0.4. That's the range that he offered. We just replicated 0.3, which is right in the middle of that. Climate Action Tracker said that it would take it down. Did they say, yeah, about 0.4. So 0.3 or 0.4, use C-Roads to improve your mental model your understanding of what it would take. So those are some possibilities for testing national models. Then do other questions? And, and mind yeah. you, okay, actually, hold on one second. We've gotten to the top of the hour. We told you this is gonna be a 60 minute webinar. So what I'd like to do is to just wrap this up and then note that we will stick around for some more questions. Now, what is the journey that we've taken? The journey that we've taken is we threat, we set this up as how might China get to be net zero by 2060? And if the rest of the world followed suit, what could be done? What did we learn? There's no silver bullet. No one action got us there. Instead, we saw it took many seeds to plant this garden. And I'll go back to the garden that we planted before. Uh, it took many seeds to get down to 1.5 degrees. One note about what kind of seeds. There were no scenarios that got us there without keeping coal, oil, and gas in the ground. Burning coal, oil, and gas is the main cause of climate change. Therefore, stopping that will be one of the main solutions, unavoidable. And fourth point, it's still possible. There are ways to significantly avoid the worst case scenarios. As we do it, we need to make sure we implement policies that don't hurt marginalized communities. And ideally that actually help that make things better because there are abundant co-benefits that can be captured in the near term. We showed you air quality as one of the examples in the model. We offer this model for you to play with yourself, but also to engage others in the world. Go out, take it, show it to people and think with them about what they can do to contribute to this. We heard about what you would love about being part of this kind of world and we read many of the things that you are gonna do next as a result of this experience. Overall, getting to this kind of future, getting here to the future we really want is not gonna be easy, it's gonna be worth it. Go get them, let us know how it all goes, and we really hope you can be part of this community. Okay, bye-bye everybody.